Well, hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Resha Power and Cut, and episode 148, I believe, which is quite a lot. Uh, we're gonna start with the one of the Austin Allegro shells. The, this is the second one, obviously. Again, recapping, most of you will have seen her. We, I don't think we gain that much audience each week, so uh, I imagine that everybody will be familiar with the project, so uh, I won't give any background, but here we have uh, an Austin Allegro shell, which has been stripped down to basically the bits more or less the bits we need we've actually still got a bit more here than we do need we don't need the parcel shelf we don't actually need the quarter panels we do need the front panel and we do need the apertures and we do need the roof so that's pretty much stripped down rich has been busy on that uh, cleaning up all the seams getting the seam sealer off drilling the spot welds belt sandering the spot welds off generally getting everything peeled back as far as he can um, while still keeping enough structural integrity to allow us to actually fit it to the integral floor pan, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, the sills, we don't actually use these. We're not using these sill sections at all. They've been left in place, though trimmed back, so that they just hold the bottom of the door aperture accurate and hold, hold everything in place there. Obviously, we've got these brace bars tacked in, but it's nice to have um, a, a, that, that in place as well, just to make sure that the bottom of the pillar can't move and give us a bit more stability to the uh, to the body shell there. So that's why we've got those left in place. Yeah, that's basically ready now for the first rough trial fit over the other Integra, which we'll come on to in a minute. So then I'm gonna make Jamie's life hard because he's got a different gimbal at the moment because we've had a bit of a breakdown with our normal camera gimbal. So he's, uh, he's back limping along with the old one, which is, uh, which is hard work and liable to just sort of pan off to the sky at random intervals. So uh, hopefully it won't do that. So on to Churchill, Mark II Jag, two-door coupe. Uh, Stu's busying on with a lot of the dry build tasks. Um, I've just noticed he's fitted these rather nice ducts through the inner wing, which I don't think we've mentioned before. Well, we have, we've mentioned them before, but I don't think they were fitted before. Uh, these are a 3D printed part based on a CAD model done from a scan of the inner wing um, and then used to, to make the 3D print. So obviously they fit exactly to the inner wing and they're in two halves. There's, a, there's one half in the engine bay, one half underneath, and then the two halves are screwed together uh, with some bolts tapped into them, but they, they then clamp the inner wing perfectly in between. Got one which feeds the cold air to the engine from the air cleaner, which longer term viewers will realize is down there, mounted under the uh, outer wing. And then the other side feeds the air to the HVAC unit through the inner wing from, again, from under the uh, outer wing from a, an air intake at the front, which then feeds the HVAC unit. So he's got just got those in place, just trial fitting those. The final items are still going to be made yet. Um, and then moving on from that, uh, you, I can't remember whether we mentioned before, we've got the final steering rack mounts to make. Uh, George has finished the CAD work on those, got the steering rack mounts made, uh, drawn up. Uh, then we've CNC plasma cut the blank uh, pieces for those. We revised how we were doing the steering rack mounts a little bit. He, we cut the, um, CNC cut the, uh, the various parts to make those as a sort of flat pack. Uh, then Stu has fabricated the mounts and got them tacked onto the cross member. We'll fully weld those when we can drop the cross member off. But they're now uh, tacked on. I believe they're tacked on anyway. Yes, they're tacked on at the moment. What we're waiting for at the moment uh, is the material to make the bushes. As part of the drawing for those, we're fitting that with some... We wanted a little bit of isolation, but not very much isolation because the cross member itself is also isolated from the body via some rubber mounts. So we don't want to put too much rubber into the steering rack mounts so else everything gets a bit too loose. So it's just judging the refinement and having some means of isolating the rack from the cross member, but not too much. So we're using, we've elected to use nylon bushes in there. So as part of his drawing, George has drawn some tubes which house a pair of top hat nylon bushes each side. And then they'll have a stainless crush tube through, which will receive the bolt that holds the steering rack on. Uh, and we're waiting for the nylon to make those bushes because they need uh, spinning up in the lathe. So we're just waiting for that. I think that's actually ready to collect. We, we, we get a lot of our sort of small quantities of random materials from two places. There's a place called Metal Mania, who are literally, a, almost just almost literally a stone's throw from our unit. They're in Hinkley, um, about a third of a mile away. Um, so we use them quite a lot. That's Metal Mania. We also use a company called Rapid Metals in Coventry. Their range of stuff is a little bit more, but obviously they're a bit further away. Still very local to us, very helpful. Uh, we're actually waiting for a couple of bits from um, Rapid Metals one of which is ironically plastic, which is the nylon for making those bushes. And the other parts are a couple of things to do some work in the workshop actually, which is that we are putting in, I think a couple of people have said this in comments in the past about having overhead services. 
It's something we've looked at in the past and put on the back burner a few times. I may have mentioned this before, I may be repeating myself, I can't remember. The hesitation I'd always had with doing it before was that we wanted 240 volt services overhead as well. And that's really difficult because there are very few ultra reliable uh, retracting, spring retracting 240 volt extension leads. They're just very hard to get hold of and they, they tend in a gritty environment, the slip rings in them tend to expire pretty quickly and they're very expensive to buy to start with and they don't last. Now we've gone almost wholly over to cordless tools. We don't really use much in the way of 240 volt portable tooling, which means that we can, own, we can get away with only having air services overhead, which is actually really easy to do because the air retracting reels are fairly reliable. We don't really have many problems with those. So what we're actually doing is we're mounting overhead, pairs of overhead um, air reels above the fabrication bays up here. And long story coming back to where I started is that I'm waiting for the materials also from Rapid Metals to make the cradles, to fabricate the cradles for those overhead um, air reels that we're going to be fitting. So in, in upcoming weeks, keep an eye out in the background, you'll see some uh, air hoses dangling down from the ceiling fairly soon. So that's all to come. Moving back onto the Churchill project, Stu, now he's done the steering rack mounts, he's moved onto the exhaust system. System. We've elected to do the exhaust fabrication at this stage on the grounds that we have all the work to be doing bodywork wise still. Um, we figured we may as well get the exhaust done while the car's bare metal. It's easier to do all the mountings, it's easier to get everything else achieved while the car's still at a, a relatively rough, in inverted commas, stage, i.e., there's no shiny paint around. So Stu started work on fabricating the exhaust system, so you'll be able to see that develop through next, through next week. We mentioned the planning on it before, the pipe sizing. Uh, I think last week I picked up on the comment from somebody talking about running uh, two systems, twin, twin pipes, loop to one and back apart to two again, which was an entirely correct thing, and that is, the, that is basically the plan with this car. So, yeah, we'll watch it and see how that develops. So that's, uh, that's what Stu's on with on this. Tom, as we've mentioned before, is still on with the um, metal finishing on that side of the car. It's being a little bit traumatic, as I mentioned last week, and it continues to be a bit traumatic. So yeah, more of the same on that. There's not really much elaboration there. It is not very exciting. Uh, for, for unfortunately for Tom or us, and he'd be the first to agree on that. It, 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 it's not the favourite, anybody's favourite part of the job, and it's incredibly noisy. So um, yes, it, we, we're all we're all looking forward to the uh, to the close of that particular chapter. But it's getting there. It's a lot closer than it was. So I think that's where we are on Churchill. Moving rapidly on, Bobby is uh, literally working while we speak on the, on the first uh, Allegro project, the project looking strike. We've got this bonnet which is the bonnet from that car, obviously, because it's brown. Um, this is not the one that we're going to be taking the mould off for the carbon. This is a spare bonnet. So we're actually doing various bits of work using this bonnet where there's potential for damage um, so that we guarantee no damage on the one that uh, the mould is being taken from. So I'll be currently working on the bonnet hinges and fabricating the mountings for those. Having uh, had a little look into it, We've obviously got Mark 1 Escort standard bonnet hinges lying around because we're not using those on the Mark 1 Escort. So we elected that, you, we, I'm backtracking slightly, the other, the other um, consideration is that we want a parallel linkage type hinge on this car as opposed to the original type of bonnet hinge in that we want the bonnet to be able to move slightly forward as it opens to sort of disengage it from the scuttle area. We can't just hinge it on a simple hinge. It needs to, it needs to move forward slightly as it opens. So we need a parallel linkage type hinge. Uh, and we've obviously lost the original mounting points from the Allegro because that bit of Allegro is gone. So we've got to fabricate those anyway. We decided that a good start point would be an escort um, bonnet hinge. So Bobby's worked, had, had a little look at that, and they fit as if they were sort of made for the space and made for the job of the Allegro bonnet. So uh, the mock-up work's gonna be done with those, and then we will make some, uh, some nicer ones further down the line. But for the moment, we've used the escort hinges as a sort of a ready-made mock-up hinge, and that's all uh, coming together really well. Bobby's got the fabricate, he's fabricated the, the mount plate, which is all magneted in place this side. He's copying that for that side. Once that's done, then that'll be tacked in place. I'm imagining he'll do a little trial fit to make sure everything lines up okay and then fully weld those plates in. That actually kind of finishes off that back corner of the engine bay quite nicely, ties the back edge of the turret into the bulkhead and closes off. Where we've got the little closing panel that we put in, it's actually going to, on the other car, we won't bother putting those closing panels in because the bonnet hinge mounting panel 
will substitute that really nicely. On this, we've obviously already got it in. It's not worth cutting it out. But on the other car, actually, it will, we won't need that closing panel. The bonnet hinge mount panel will do the job of that as well. So quite convenient. So it's getting on with that. Earlier in the week, um, Bobby was finishing off the seatbelt mountings. They're all done now. Uh, we talked about it um, a reasonable amount last week. Uh, the, the major bit that was left to do was the upper mount, not, it's not a major bit, but the, the, um, the steadying mount for the rear. Basically, the Honda seatbelt mounts. I don't know if there's an inertia reel lying around. I don't think there is, actually, to show you. But the, oh, is there one on the... Um, oh, they're upstairs, yeah. So the, um, the Honda seatbelt mounts have um, the main, the, the, the main uh, inertia reel, obviously, and below that, the main mounting, which is the, uh, the main load-bearing mount that takes the load during an accident. And that's actually quite flexible and bendy, but obviously very strong in tension. And the, the basis is that when you, if you have an accident, the, the, the whole assembly will pull dead straight to that mount. But to keep it steady when it's not involved in an accident, there's, a, there's another much smaller bracket which holds the top of the inertia reel assembly and stops it from flapping about, basically, on, it, on its other bracket. Um, and that's the main thing that Bobby's added uh, in the back earlier this week, was, uh, was making those upper mount brackets to steady the inertia reels in the back to stop them wobbling around and vibrating. Um, as I say, in, in the event of an accident, that bracket will just snap off. It's held on with a couple of very small rivets. And as soon as, if you're in an accident, under an accident load, the seatbelt mount will just pull straight, pull taut, um, and the upper bracket will either bend or come off or whatever happens to it. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's done its job of just sta stabilising that, um, that, that unit during you know, the life of the car. But in, in the worst case of an accident, it's irrelevant. All of the load is transferred directly in a straight line between the shoulder mounting on the seatbelt and the bolt, the eye bolt holding the um, inertia reel mounting on. That will simply pull to a straight line. Any deviation on that straight line will be torn off effectively by the accident loading. So those, uh, but those steady mounts are now fitted, so they're in place. Um, then Bobby's also made the mountings for the boot lid hinges. During the modification at the back, we lost the structure that supported the boot lid hinges. Structure in that sentence is probably a bit of an exaggeration. There were a couple of very, very, very slim bent tabs that weren't really up to the job of the standard boot lid and were a bit wobbly. Um, so cutting them off wasn't such a bad thing. We've lost those. Bobby's fabricated some much nicer sort of buttresses that spot weld under the, um, under the parcel shelf. And they carry the hinges, currently carry the original Austin hinges because they do the job. But I think we're going to probably do some um, laser cut uh, stainless steel hinges for the back just because they'd be very simple. It's cheaper than getting the machine. We don't really need a machine part because it's all a single plane part with one fold on it. So basically a single plane part with a bolt flange on the end. So it's an incredibly simple part. So I think we're just going to laser cut those in stainless. If we get them nitrogen laser cut so they've got clean edges and no burning on, then they'll be a really, a, just a really nice part to just leave as is, I think, in there for, uh, for holding the boot lid on. Um, in terms of the panels, we've actually had a visit from Pete uh, from KS Composites this morning. He's come to visit and have a little look at the job and a couple of other things that we're doing as well that Carol will probably talk about. Um, but uh, from my point of view in here, Pete's come and had a look at uh, the Allegro uh, in terms of whether the, he thinks the flanges will work and the way we, where we're orientating the flanges on the quarter panels and uh, the mounting flanges there, which he's very happy with. That's all good. Everything will be fine there. Boot lid all fine. Door skin is pretty simple. Wings fairly simple. Everything's okay there. Bonnet, we've got a couple of complications on the main one being the rear edge and the fact that it's beyond 90 degrees. So we need to have a little look at that um, to be able to, because we're, we're doing this as, these as two piece mouldings. So we've got the outer skin and then we've got a full inner skin so that we can have exposed um, weave carbon potentially on the inside and that it is a show um, surface. It's an A surface finish on the underside of the bonnet. We don't, we're trying to avoid having a B surface finish on the underside of the bonnet. In order to do that, we've got to be able to glue the inside piece in. In order to glue the inside piece in, you can't have a, uh, an angle beyond 90 degrees on the edge of the bonnet because obviously you can't get the inside bit in. So we've just got to have a little look at various options on this, which I think the primary one is probably going to be just unfolding the edge of the bonnet, but we've got to then obviously watch for the curvature change in the bonnet when we do that. So once again, having a second bonnet that we don't need, is going to be very useful there because we can assess how much that will change the line of the bonnet as we do that. So onwards, that's all got to be done. I'm getting um, probably too elaborate on all this at the moment. Uh, the uh, dashboard here is the Allegro dash that we're actually basing the final dash on. This bit here, which is the standard two-clock base model Allegro dash, 
we're actually going to be reusing, albeit slightly modified and re-trimmed. But we need to extend it because we're actually moving the dash towards the driver a little bit, just because of the, the revised driving position. So I'm extending this. This is actually slightly over length, this piece of steel here. This is slightly over length. I took a photograph, got it into CAD as a canvas, then um, sketched around it to draw up this piece. CNC plasma cut them where the vents will be another sort of hexagon design. These are not the vents, these are just the blank holes. The bezels will screw, uh, alumin machined aluminium bezels will screw over these, so ignore the shape of the holes, they're just a clearance hole with a rough hexagon shape um, for roughly where the, vent, the, the screen vents are actually going to go, the Demis vents. Um, but this extension is going to be spot welded onto the, um, the dash, which obviously we've, I've cut the um, foam away from the top of the dash to expose the internal steel, and we can spot weld these pieces of steel to that, seam weld up the middle with the TIG, get all that sort of the right shape and then that'll come in the car and I can trim this edge uh, back a little bit and then we'll bracket it all. We're getting rid of the substructure metalwork which is sort of in the back of the car at the moment. We're getting rid of that substructure metalwork because it doesn't really do anything. I'm not quite sure what that was even there for. I don't know whether there was an original, a different dash design originally planned for the Allegro or something, but certainly this bit doesn't need that bit to it was short of a few screw holes it doesn't really need that bit so i'm not quite sure what's going on there but we're actually going to bracket all of this lot to a very quite a slender tube that will carry the dash and we don't need any of that heavy mess that was sort of under there that was carrying the dash originally so so a bit of a revision gone on there so yeah dash is a work in progress i'd like it to have been a bit further on but the week's been a, a, a busy week of uh, lots of sort of uh, s lots of things that have drawn me away from getting that done um, <laughs> Moving on to the E-Type, V12 Series 3 E-Type. Sam's still ploughing on through this and doing a really good job. He's got the uh, tunnel side finished for this side, which I think he was working on the last video. He's got the rear section of the floor in. Again, we split the floor, we mentioned that before. Centre section of the floor can't go in until after the sill is done. So he's working on the sill reinforcement, as you can see here. Another section, same as the other side, it's really just a repeat of the other side. Section of four inch tube in, gusset mounts being welded in, which tie, tie that into the rest of the substructure. The large gusset structure in the back, which ties it into the wheel arch structure. And then the, he'll cap off the front of the sill with the original type sill cappings, which will tie, the, which will cap, tie into the front of the tube. Tubes all tied and buttressed into the bulkhead structure, so it adds an immense amount of strength into the uh, into the body tub. So that's he's getting pretty much towards the end of the sill reinforcement. Then it'll be a case of fitting the floor, and then it'll be a case of the fitting both outer sills. As I say, fitting the floor, he's also got to do the footwell ends as well. So it's quite a long, uh, quite a long slog to getting all those bits done, but but uh, getting through it very well. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work. as you can see, you, you get the idea of the scale of things when you look at the. Uh, the the quantity of grinding grit you can just pick up off something like that. It's a, it's a big old handful of grit. There's a lot of, a lot of weld dressing going on there and a lot of grinding out of original spot welds. They're very hard. In a, in a lot of cases, you, you can't really use a spot weld drill. Anybody who's done this work before will know that there's no one answer to dismantling an existing body. A spot weld drill is a useful piece of is a useful tool, but a belt sander is probably a more useful tool and the bulk of spot welds that get removed get removed with one of those. And that's probably the main tool for spot weld removal and that's what an awful lot of that grinding grit will be from, will be spot weld removal using that. And so they, uh, that's working hard for its living. As we, we mentioned before about the, uh, the tools and that's we're really, really pleased with those. We waited for a long time for Milwaukee to come up with those belt sanders and they're, uh, they're, they're living up to uh, expectation. They're doing really well. So yeah, that's where we're at with uh, V12 E-Type. Sam's plowing on. Um, I imagine he'll be uh, glad to see the back of sill structure, but, uh, but he's, uh, he's getting there. And wandering over here, I will, uh, pon I'll pause around here. I think, um, yeah, Jamie will be able to catch a bit of this from that side. Scott's working on this quite complicated piece um, to sort of uh, show it in some of its glory. When people say, oh, my Honda's not rusty. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's the inner structure of the rear jacking point and rear trailing arm mount, which if I kind of move it around on camera and you don't look too closely, it looks quite good. But if you look really closely through it, it looks like a photograph of the Milky Way. Uh, it's got a lot of pinholes. They're made of such thin steel, these um, Hondas. Uh, they're made to very high standard, but out of very thin steel. So that when undercoating fails, it, um, 
it, 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 there's not much steel thickness to back up the, uh, you know, when, once corrosion takes a hold, it doesn't take very long at all before the material gets perforated, and that is quite significantly perforated, although it probably doesn't look it on camera. Uh, there's an awful lot of very small holes in there. So Scott's busy away on fabricating what is quite a complicated piece there, and he's uh, making a very nice job of that. But this is where the hours go. So you can see, you know, that's, see the two pieces side by side there now. That's where your hours go on a job like this, Make, making bits like that. You can't buy it, Honda don't supply it. And I would pretty much guarantee that any uh, DC2 Integra that's been in the UK for any length of time, and probably any Civic as well, that, ha that we, with the same structure, it's probably going to have that corrosion. It's just how much underseal it's covered in and how many MOT plates it's had welded over it. <laughs> but that's why there's this big hole here. We were kind of hoping this, this car on the face of it looked a bit better than the previous one. And actually, I think it's probably worse in terms of there's less big holes through things, but more tiny pinholes on those structural bits. But anyway, we'll get it done. It's all, uh, it's all part of the job. Um, so yeah. Um, Scott's getting that bit done, then he can put all the rest of the structure back together, put that down, he's peeled all that general area, that's the piece that went over there originally, so that's been extricated to get at that, so that's the side, the, uh, the side sill structure which sat there, so that's been peeled off as well, and again you can see the inner corrosion on that, again from the outside in the sill, just a few pinholes, the rest just looks like surface rust. When you get onto the inside of it, you start to realise it's pretty grim. It's pretty badly corroded in a few places. Um, and then the inner part of that, where, with the um, uh, jacking point welded into it, again, all removed. All of that lot has to come to pieces and then all be pieced all back together again in order to get that structure back into that corner. So there's quite a lot of work there. And again, it brings it home to you, as me wobbling a loose bit of steel there, it brings it home to you how critical it is to have this car on the jig, because we've actually got a jig point just under there, which is carrying the rear trailing arm, the main rear trailing arm mount, which is just under this section here. So that can't move at all. So we know we've got a fixed point there to work from. So none of this structure is changing shape while we've got all this apart to be rebuilt. Very important. Uh, as you can see across the floor, Scott's finished off the weld dressing from the floor shortening exercise, that's all done, looks really good. And then he's also moved on to the bulkhead modifications. He's finished off, I, as you'd seen in previous episodes, I basically just crudely body sawed off the top of the bulkhead. Um, Scott's moved on, tidied that up, cut some more off down here, tidied up the ends, removed the bits that I hadn't yet removed. I think he's still got a bit more removal to do at that end. But basically getting this close to the stage of being able to drop the Allegro body on. He's blanked off the um, original Allegro um, demist vent outlet uh, because we now, as you'll recall from the other car, use this as the main scuttle air intake to the HVAC unit through this hole here. So yeah, it's progressing pretty well. Uh, the front's got to be trimmed up where I roughly just chopped it off with the plasma. That's got to be trimmed up. He's marked out the trim line on the rear of the boot floor so he can get that cut down to position and then and once he's done the rock repair both sides, he's going to have much the same to do that side as this side. At that point, we're about on track for getting the uh, body dropped on and the six mounting holes put in it, uh, the six brackets put on that will be the temporary alignment points until we have the two structures welded together. So that's where we're at on that. And then I think, moving swiftly on, we will go into the body shop and have a little look at where we are in here, which is Project Kuma Escort. We are in similar position to where we were last week. It's just that final 10% taking 90% of the time thing, just the panel fits. We've been battling a little bit on the front wings, a little bit here and there on the doors. And the other thing, which I think I mentioned before, but I'll mention again anyway, just in case I didn't, is the bonnet and boot we're having made in carbon but they need to be the same from one car to the other. So we are double checking, and that's where the guys are at the moment, is next door, double checking that the bonnet from the first, that, that fits the first car also fits this car, because they need to fit each other identically. The car must fit the bonnet, because the bonnet, once it's done in carbon, will need to fit both cars from the same mold. Same with the boot lid. So they're just verifying that. But we're very, very, very close now. A little bit more work on the front wings, a little bit more titivating here and there. We had to do a bit of tweaking on this wing, as you can see by this little bit of filler here, and a little height discrepancy down that wing, which meant us just having to drop part of that wing and lift another part and lift the front of the wing and drop that part of the wing. A few, uh, few alterations here and there, but it's very, very close now. So yeah, that's all 
all, all in, a, in a, a pretty good position really we're, we're, we're on the final straight now I know I've said this before but we really are on the final straight and you'll be able to see what the final straight leads on to next door uh, with Calvary shortly uh, with, the, uh, with the Project One Escort which is progressing well as well and then finally you may be asking uh, what this is well this is a Chevette estate that we did a considerable amount of work on some time ago, off the top of my head, I think it was about seven years ago um, that this went back to its owner. Uh, its owner's a local guy, we know him, he actually knows a couple of our, uh, our chaps, he knows um, Adam that works for us uh, fairly, Adam Gibbons that works for us quite well. Um, so this went away from us because, due to sort of, uh, main, mainly due to um, the customer's uh, the job. He, he's, he's involved, he's travel, he's working away an awful lot of the time. And I think a combination of sort of changes of job, financial circumstances and working away so much of the time that he couldn't really be here to do, deal with the project meant that this went into storage for a little while, uh, which in a little while ended up being about seven years. We've now got it back because again, we've got a little bit of a gap in the body schedule between the Escort and the next car through, uh, which meant we could actually get this back in. He'd asked if we had any chance to slot it back in for the actual final paint. It's actually already done. We've finished the underside. The underside is all zinc metal sprayed, raptured and, and in final body color. The inside of the car all in final body colour but the panels all need the prep work doing they've had the start but not very much more than that and the outside has been painted in this sort of tooth toothpaste mint colour um, which was uh, just a mixture of 2k acrylics that we had kicking around to basically put a sealing coat on the outside of the car while it went into storage so it's basically paint the outside of the car get the panel fits sorted because there's been a couple of things there's a bit of damage done in storage and a couple of other little things that need titivating and uh, adjusting but nothing too drastic so the door door to wing shuts need a bit of uh, adjustment they always do on uh, chevettes and cadets they're always a bit so the aftermarket wings are not amazing they don't really fit the door very well so we've got a bit of tweaking to do there um, but then yeah we'll, we'll be putting the final paint on this um, so that the customer can have that back and uh, get on with assembling it. That's having a Vauxhall um, red top XE, 16 valve in it, uh, Manta axle, um, five speed gearbox, um, and basically being built to a sort of a, a, a road rally type spec, basically, is the, uh, is the aim with the car. It's just a sort of fast road car, really. I don't know whether it may do some road rally type events or tigers or something, but, um, but that, that's the, the, the aim of the car is just a fun tarmac car. So, uh, yeah, so it's a very nice car, actually. It's needed, it, 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 as, as rust goes on these, and these do, anybody that knows uh, Chevette and Cadet Estates will tell you they rust horrendously. It was actually a really good one. It was a surprisingly good car. Still needed a lot of work, but surprisingly good. But anyway, on that note, that's where we're at in the body shop. I think I've waffled on it long enough, so I will hand over to Cal, and he can take you through the, uh, the week in the assembly workshop. Oh, thank you, Nat. Uh, I am going to start with the Morris. Uh, so obviously last week was differential noise misery. Uh, we've now dropped the diff out and sure enough, exactly as suspected, the aftermarket crown wheel and pinion appear to be made of cheese um, because it's just probably more worn than I've ever seen a crown wheel, I think apart from the one in my Subaru Forester, which was uh, in a thousand pieces. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, considering I've literally done like 150 to 200 miles in the car, it's horrendously worn. Uh, and it was definitely set up correctly. Um, I know it was, well, I've got photos of the paint marking on it and Matt and Jim both checked it together. So we are gonna go with plan B, which is uh, to, to go for a used Mazda crown wheel and pinion. I can't, I can no longer get direct from Mazda the ratio that I want, which is why we ended up with an aftermarket one in the first place. So, uh, yeah, got a used one on the way now. Fingers crossed that'll solve the problem. Uh, so that's going to, I think, um, Anthony's just been stripping everything apart. He's, because there was so much metal everywhere in there, he's pulled the entire limited slip differential apart. I think the parts of that are under that cloth there, but stripped all the plates apart, everything. So everything could be meticulously cleaned. And obviously we're going to put new bearings in it because they'll have had a lot of metal going through them. Um, so new bearings are on the way good used 
crown well and pinion um, and we'll get all that together um, hopefully early part of next week with a bit of luck uh, so that's where we're at with that essentially uh, the only other thing worth mentioning is we had the little seat belt guides remade because I talked before about this I wasn't very happy with the shape of them they were kind of causing the seat belt to be quite hard to pull through so we had a we did a tweak on the design had them made I had them on when I went driving on it last week and they were perfect so um, they've now been removed and gone for anodizing uh, James is carrying on with the exhaust fabrication on the Camaro. Uh, so yeah, multiple exhaust fabrication jobs going on at the minute. And then if you follow me this way, um, a few changes. So project one is, well, actually, at this exact minute, not looking as good as it did the other day, uh, when we had the matching wheels all round on it and it was on the deck and rolling. Um, so we had it on that ramp. We just needed to get it off so we could get the Morris on there. Um, and I think towards the tail end of last week, we've got the colour sorted uh, for the wheels. They were painted on the Thursday or Friday. Happy they were hard enough to uh, get the tyres fitted on the Monday. So we've got the tyres on on the Monday, um, got it rolling. Um, and yeah, I think we were basically just, we were in the latter stages of getting all the subframes on. I think we were just waiting for the struts back from Nitron as well. But yes, it's always a, a proper buzz seeing a car on the ground for the first time. And you get to see a hint of the stance, which unfortunately I can't now show you because it's on this ramp. Um, and we needed to do a few more tweaks on the ride height anyway. Um, but nonetheless, big, big landmark. You'll notice it's got the bonnet back on it at the minute and that's the, we've, we've had the same bonnet. These are going to be carbon. We're going to be moulding these. Um, but we had this bonnet on this car. And obviously, because we're going to mould them on, we needed to make sure both cars were exactly the same in terms of their bonnet and bootlid, actually, um, fitment. So the guys have had it, that bonnet in the body shop for the second car, um, making sure, it, getting all the alignment of the bonnet with all the surrounding panels sorted, um, which is all fine. But we thought, there seems to be this magical ghost in our workshop that just changes things. So you can get everything perfect in, in mock-up and then it seems like things change. So mindful of the ghost, <laughs> we decided we'd try the bonnet back on this car again, to be absolutely sure, uh, which is looking fine, actually. Uh, it was also a good opportunity to try the billet bonnet hinges um, that we've done, which are fitted on here at the minute. So uh, the Sons gas strut at the minute, there's gonna be a little gas strut on those, which with the carbon bonnet should be, it's not gonna be enough to open it up, but the idea is that once you've got it up, it'll hold it up. Um, and there's a few things going together in here as well. We've got the steering column in, we've got the various bits on the bulkhead, we've started making up some of the aircon lines, we've got the fuel pressure regulator in there. Um, so very much in progress uh, with, the, with the assembly. I think the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna get the heater box back in it on a temporary basis so Alex can measure up the exact wiring routing with that mindful of the position of that because he's now finished the design work for the main dash looms that's the one that kind of goes from the PDM all of the components on the dash and then it's got legs for the front and front kind of right and left leg a leg for the engine ECU uh, and then a leg for, leg for the rear and then he's also done the sort of interior engine loom leg so that's the one that goes from the engine ECU to the bulkhead connector and then has a branch out to the main dash loom as well so designed for that done so we just need the measurements for those now uh, and we'll be able to make those wiring harnesses up and we'll show the process of that when we get into it um, other than that, yeah, it's just, just cracking on with general assembly stuff. So um, we've got the check straps on the doors, which is always sensible to get on at this point, save uh, them bending back on themselves. Uh, we're getting various parts in place to get the rest of the door builds done. So Anthony's re rebuilt the regulators for the windows. Uh, we've got the window channels ready to go in. We're pretty, in fact, to be fair, I think we're pretty much in a position to get the, the whole window assemblies in there. Um, and then upstairs, continuing to beaver away, the guys, are working on some of the interior parts. So Luke's been working on the door panel design. We're doing some some nice, we're trying to add just a slight, slight three-dimensional element. Sometimes just doing a flat card can look a bit 2D. We're doing like a, a, a surround around the speaker, even though the speakers are flat in the door, just a slightly raised surround that will be upholstered with then a, a machine grill within that, which will also have the badge for the, the car on there. And then there's just going to be a flash of a, a tweed material, which, we, which is what we're having on the seats. We're having Recaro seats, charcoal side bolsters, a sort of blue, gray, and black uh, houndstooth um, Harris tweed on the centers of the seats. And then there's a flash of that in the door cards as well. Um, all of the door furniture, I think we showed being designed before. So the window winders, door release handles, um, we're having leather pull straps, pull the doors shut with a little machine piece on each end. Um, 
And then we're doing the finishing touches to the center console design as well, which is gonna have a recess to put your phone, USB socket, it's got the gear sticks around with three buttons in it, which are headlights, uh, front, and head, rear, front and rear heated screens. Um, and then at the very back, there's just a little rotary controller for the audio system, just volume control for the audio. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of parts design going on. And again, with the 3D scanning facility, it means we can scan for things like the door panels. So I think as this plan stands at the minute, we're gonna actually water jet the door cards themselves out of uh, ABS plastic um, with all the detail in them already. Um, so yeah, just carrying on with the parts design process and in tandem with general assembly and uh, it should, should take shape reasonably quickly. Um, I think Adam was also on with the some bits of the engine. I think last week we were talking about the fact we were just mocking or trialing the um, new flywheel we had made for the BD engine to work with the Retro Ford MX-5 gearbox adapter plate so we've mocked all that up. We also got the clutch slave mounted in there. Just wanted to check that the slave position was correct for the clutch. Ticked all that off. So then the flywheel, um, adapter plate and starter motor and clutch could all go off to Sherwood so he can tr have all of those on the final engine when it's dynoed. Um, and then also we were doing a modification on the MX-5 gearbox with that conversion with the retro forward adapter plate. You have to machine out uh, a section of the gearbox casing just for clearance on the nose of the starter motor. So we've done that. Um, so yeah, all, all going in the right direction really on that one. Uh, and then Land Cruiser, I've driven for the first time. So uh, that was, ooh, was it yesterday? I think it was. I think it was so quick, I probably didn't, we probably didn't even get any footage of it. And it was literally just a quick spin down the road. Um, but uh, yeah, a pretty positive result actually. Um, things I was worried about were not an issue. So transmission, um, it's a full mechanical transmission from an 80 series. Um, and we intentionally wanted it mechanical to keep things simple. But obviously at the back of my mind, I had, oh, what's the shift, shift sort of uh, harshness gonna be like? Um, the only sort of load input it has is the, um, there's a cable off the throttle linkage that tells it basically how wide the throttle is. Um, but yeah, that shifted perfectly. Um, I was also worried about what sort of it was going to be like inside the cabin in terms of vibrations and noise. And I was actually pleasantly surprised on that as well. Um, so that, that was good. Two big ticks there. Uh, the sort of weight of the controls felt really good. The brakes feel good, throttle fine. Steering feels good. It's got electric power steering on it. That all felt fine. Um, felt a little bit wandery and vague, but the, the road outside here is particularly bad in terms of camber and bends and it's a narrow lane. And I don't imagine these were ever the most stable vehicle. So um, I'm going to reserve judgment on that until I've done a few more miles on it. Um, other than that, I think it was generally, oh, the only other thing I want to make an edit on, which is probably the next job on it. The pedal positions, now I've driven it, are not great. I'm going to lower the brake pedal position, the, uh, and the, sorry, the throttle pedal position and the brake pedal position. Throttle pedal is going to need uh, a, a modification to the actual pedal itself. It's essentially just a standard pedal at the minute. And then the brake pedal, I think we can just adjust the clevis to pull that down nearer to the floor. Because um, at the moment they're a little bit high up, so you find yourself kind of hovering your leg over the, the pedals to get them to get in a comfortable position. And obviously that's not going to be comfortable after a few miles. Um, so yeah, we're going to adjust those pedals. Uh, and then I think we'll be ready to go out for a slightly longer drive at that point. So probably next time I go out, I'll have Dave Rowe with me in the passenger seat and he can start doing some more refinement of the map. It's just got a very basic calibration on the ECU at the minute just to get us going. But uh, I think what we'll probably do is do quite a lot of the light load stuff just on the road. Um, so that's that, yeah, cool. And I think just as a last comment, uh, Stratos, um, we've buttoned up the air conditioning. I think Adam's actually just waiting for me to gas that now and test it, and then we can get all the interior back in on that. Um, so that's good. And then Mustang, who've been kind of going back and forth a bit on the door cards. I talked before about the fact the standard door card clips, combined with the fact the cards aren't a particularly good fit, um, kept popping out. So we've been trialing all sorts of different ones. Uh, and I think we've come to the conclusion that actually Camaro door panel clips, which are quite similar to, to some VW ones, but they're just slightly different. They seem to engage slightly nicer. So I've got a Summit Racing order on the way from the States. I thought, well, I might as well throw in the uh, clips on that order. So I'm gonna try Camaro door panel clips on this, which we had a few of them lying around, which we've already trialed a little bit and it seemed okay. So I've got enough to do the rest of the car. Um, 
and yeah so hopefully that will resolve that problem and we'll be getting through the little niggles on this and uh, hopefully be able to get it back to the owner and i think on that note uh i'm gonna end uh what i might just say as a final thing today is tarquin's last day uh, his name, actual name is james um but, but forever now he will be known as tarks uh so uh, i'd like to say on behalf of everybody uh, it's been a pleasure having him around and thank you tarks for all your hard work and uh, everyone else i shall see you next week Thank you.